what? Ja, maar dat doe ik ook. 
Raised the, uh, the the tag here, but it's uh, it's a Dutch abbreviation V O in actie, so that's uh, scientific education in action, because we're we've been consistently uh, underfunded for the last ten years at least, and we've we've reached rock bottom. So something has to change. That's why we're now outside. Uh, there were lectures outside yesterday. Uh, you guys are very lucky because boss is going to take you out outside again tomorrow morning at 10. <laughs> so you have the first hour inside, second hour outside. Um, you're not nearly a hundred people yet, I think. There should be a hundred. Maybe, maybe, maybe the rest will show up later, or they'll 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 um, guess that the uh, they'll hope that the uh, recording works out <coughs> and they'll catch it on YouTube. So if you're seeing this on YouTube. You should have been here, it was fun. Okay. Um, right. Um, this is my first outdoor lecture ever. So this is, uh, I'll have to uh, see how that goes. So um, today's topic is uh, about um, um, specificity and sequence entropy. This is actually about, well, it's sort of jumping ahead of what, we're, what you're going to do in the next course in uh, algorithms and sequence analysis when you have alignments uh, and the, the stuff you can do with that. So, you haven't seen many alignments, well, you've seen some alignments, um, but this is an example of an alignment where you might want to do some analysis on and um, who recognizes some, who recognizes this alignment? Nobody. Well, this, it's the, the, the title gives a hint. Yeah. So what does it tell you? Antibody. It's antibodies, right? Um, so we are looking at antibody, and it's not the whole uh, protein sequence. It's just a part. It's what it's it's one of the most interesting parts. Uh, <coughs> what is the interesting part about an antibody? The variable domains. So how can you see that this is a variable domain? There's lots of differences, right? It's variable. And where can you see that? Um, main, well, over here for, for, for one, right? So there's a couple of uh, sequences that have a lot of uh, amino acids here. 
uh, most of them don't, but even on the edges here, you see that there's uh, a, a lot of differences, small differences, right? And then if you're close enough that you can actually read the, the amino acids, you can see that even where all the sequences have amino acids, they're all different. Right? Um, on the other side, literally, you see the flanking regions which are much more conserved and they're highlighted uh, so the, the, the coloring is uh, based on the, the type of amino acid uh, and so here you have the blue, uh, blue bar which is predominantly uh, aromatic then there's another one which is uh, hydrophobic uh, and then there's a, this, you have to, you have to keep it at the fist length the microphone has to be because if you do it closer it gets louder it's very annoying um, then, so, so you see some, some conserved residues here, right? and uh, on different locations. Uh, there's a there's a very interesting pair, which is actually I th I'm not sure if all does anybody know do all the high, um, all the variable loops uh, in the immunoglobulin have this pair of very important amino acids? It's a very cryptic question. I know that. So you can actually see it in the sequence. There's a pair of amino acids that are not hydrophobic or aromatic because they're colored differently. And there's one on each side of the loop. I'm not good with colors, but you probably mean this one. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and there's another one on the other side over there. Yeah. And it's a cysteine. And then if you know your chemistry, you know what two cysteines do. Yeah, they make a covalent cysteine bridge, or a sulfur bridge, because it's the sulfurs in the cysteine side chains that are connected. Uh, why is this important? Because uh, the, the rest of the, um, of, of the uh, immunoglobulin uh, um, protein is actually structured, and this variable loop has to be variable to be able to recognize different epitopes, but you want this, this floppy bit not to influence the rest of the structure. So you basically have a, a staple um, or glue to, to hold the ends of this variable loop together so it can be flexible and the rest of the protein can be structured. Okay. So now, so these are things you can get out of this alignment when you know a bit about the biology. Um, but the, the real problem that we have as bioinformaticians is the other way around. We should be able to look at an alignment or rather, we should be able to write algorithms that analyze these alignments and tell us something about what the biology should be. Well, that's much harder, and that's, this, this lecture is part of what we can do in that area. Right? Uh, so, so the first thing you can do is identify uh, conserved residues, and then there's lots of other things you can do. So that's, uh, that's for the next two hours. Okay. So, uh, this should go on. It doesn't. Interesting. <coughs> Frozen. It's too cold. No? Oh. This one is uh, okay. So this is a different example. Here you see um, I've, who has not seen sequence logos before. Who doesn't know what a sequence logo is? Okay. So this, these are sequence logos, and there's a basically a shorthand notation of uh, an alignment where you condense the the frequency of the the different residues on different positions into the height of the letter. So there's there's a conserved um, e, uh, glutamate. Glutamate? Ah, hmm? oh, glutamic acid. Yeah, that's glutamate. Glutamic acid is glutamate. Yeah. So um, because I I remember because glutamate ends with an e, so then that's why I remember the e. Um, and it's high because it's conserved. Now, there's also a lot of alanine in the neighboring residue, but it's not so well conserved because you see some other stuff squashed down in the bottom. 
Right. And now we'll, we'll get into uh, who knows what information entropy. Who, who hasn't heard of information entropy yet uh, before? Okay, good. Because that's the lecture. Um, the, so the, the height of the, letter, of the letter here is actually scaled by the information content or the information entropy in the, in the thing. That makes why, because the total frequency of uh, the letters should be the same in all positions. So if you just scale this with the frequency, then all the bars will be filled to the top. But what you do to make it more visible where the conservation is, you scale it with the entropy. So a completely conserved uh, residue has the highest weight and less conserved, increase, increasingly have lower weights. Okay, um, and this is actually, so this is an aquaporin, which is an outer membrane protein for uh, bacteria, which lets through water out through the uh, outer membrane. And um, only water, not other, not other small molecules. And the, the reason it can do that is because it has this string of polar residues that are lining the inside of the cavity. So it's very polar and only water can uh, actually go through that. Yes. Uh, and there's more, there's more to that, but I'll, I'll skip that for uh, the sake of time. Um, oh, wait. <coughs> that helps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but now I have to stand still. I can't. <laughs> Uh, there, so, people that are more on stage than I am, uh, they actually have microphone training. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm going to skip this in, in this for the sake of time. Um, because the, the first thing that we need to do, if, if I'm sort of slipping away, please tell me. Because I can still hear myself, but you can't hear me. Um, so the first thing we need to do is count conservation. And what it is about is, um, uh, is actually looking at things that deviate from what you expect. So now we're going to take a step back and, uh, and, and work out how that, how that fits. So if you're looking at an alignment of, of, of protein sequences, and then we focus on a single column of um, basically um, equivalent residues that, that arise from different proteins from different species. Yeah, so there's, there could be yeast and E. coli and uh, humans and plants and we're all looking at, I don't know, cytochrome C. Yeah? I think all those species have a cytochrome C and, and we're looking at one column of the alignment of cytochrome C uh, protein sequences across many, many different species. But what is our naive expectation for the um, the variation of amino acids that you'll find in one column. Okay, so we're looking at this is my this is this is my cartoon for an alignment and we're looking at one column. What do you expect? Sorry? Residues from the same group. Oh, you mean like all, uh, like uh, um, um, aliphatic or, or polar ones? So something like this. Yeah, so if you know your amino acids, these are all small hydrophobic ones. Um, and, but what, um, why, why would that be? I'm, as I'm asking for your random expectation, right? But you've, you've already put another expectation on top of this. But, okay, granted, it's, it, I, I let that in because I say these are all cytochrome C. So why, if it's all cytochrome C, do you expect the amino acids here to have similar properties? Because they're conservation. Because they're conserved, right? Because they're all cytochrome C. And if you change everything, it's probably not a cytochrome C anymore. Yeah? Or it breaks, it still, it still folds like a protein, but it, it doesn't function like a cytochrome C enzyme anymore. That's something breaks. So probably these things are conserved. Now, let's, let's widen our scope. 
and say we have a collection of proteins that we align and we don't even know if they're properly related. Yeah, but they come from very many different species and we've aligned them. So now, in that scenario, what is our random expectation? Mm -hmm. You've aligned them so they're the same residue. Yeah, but if they're not related, what's the average? What's the average uh, identity between two unrelated sequences that you expect, roughly? There's twenty. There's twenty different amino acids. Five percent, right? Okay. So that means if I have uh, seven, six sequences. They're probably all going to be different. Yeah, that, that's random. Yeah, well, really random is when, when one or two of them are actually the same. Otherwise, it's not, not random. It's unlikely that they're all different. So this is what we, what we expect. If we let three billion years of evolution happen on, on, the, on an ancestor sequence, and there's nothing special that that uh, change the random uh, introduction of, uh, of mutations, this is what you get. Yeah? We, we, it's, it's hard to find it, because how do you align them if they're, if they're so divergent? Right? Okay. Um, I have to see where I'm going. Oh yes, ah, got it. So now the, we can look at the opposite side. We can, we can take the cytochrome C again, and we're now looking... Oh. Let me check if I'm still in... Uh. Okay, so, I, th I don't think you can actually read it, can't trust this. Uh, where was I going? Oh yeah, yeah. So we have our cytochrome C now, and uh, I, I don't know, anybody happens to know what is the crucial um, um, catalytic residue in the cytochrome C? I don't remember. But let's say there is an aromatic residue which, uh, which is very important somewhere, right? So then you'll find, maybe it has to be a tryptophan. You'll find this, right? So why is this, so now the question is, why is this so important? Uh, or how can you measure the importance of this versus that? Can you quantify that? So wh why is this the likely outcome? That's another way to look at it. Sorry? Random chance. So how can you how can you quantify random chance? If you throw a die, right? uh, let's say a six-sided die, and you throw it 20 times, you expect to see different numbers. Right? If, you, if you get a two all the time, then there's something odd. Well, with very likely, there's something wrong with the die, right? because it shouldn't do that. That's the same here, because, um, but why is that? How can you see that? If you if you throw, let's take a twenty-sided 20 die, right? Every every side is an amino acid. If you throw it six times, how many ways are there to get a conserved tryptophan? Twenty times. Hmm? Twenty to the power of six. Twenty to the power of six ways to get a tryptophan. Now, you have 20 to the power 6 possible different sequences of amino acids, that are collections of 6 amino acids that you get, right? You have 20 options for the first, 20 options for the second makes 400, 20 options for the third makes uh, 8,000, and so on, yeah, 20 to the sixth, um, which is about uh, a billion, 100 million or so. So, um, how many options are there to get a conserved tryptophan? Yeah, but I, I was asking. I was asking a simple question. How many ways are there to get 
There's only one way, right? Only if all six ones are tryptophan do you get conserve, completely conserved tryptophan. So there's only one way to get this. How many ways are they get a tryptophan, a valine, an isoleucine, a tyrosine, and two serines? Well, if they have to be in this order, yes. But any one of them can be the tryptophan, any one of them can be the valine. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter really whether it was these six or five, it could, be any, could have been any other. Right? So there are roughly 20 to the six ways to get this. Maybe a few, few less because there's, there's old ones that you're not, not counting. But this is only a handful. Maybe this is a million. But this is a hundred million. Yeah? So this is 20, uh, 20 to the power six minus n, where n is a relatively small number. Yeah? So that's why this is much more likely than this. Yeah? Makes sense. Okay, now, um, the next step is... Uh, yeah, so we actually have some examples on the, on the, on the screen as well. Uh, if you have three amino acids, there's only one way to get three tryptophans. But if you have three ren... Oh, that doesn't work. <sighs> Need more hands. Um, if you have three different amino acids, and it doesn't matter which one they are, then you have six ways with only three sequences. If you have... Uh, sorry, three... Uh, six ways with three sequences, yeah. If you have six sequences, then it's much more even. Yeah? Because there's... Well, how do you count that? How, ca how do you count the number of ways to get this? Let's, let's do this one. We have six. So how many ways are there to get a mix of five amino acids in a set of six? Sorry? Oh, it's a uh, faculty of six. Yes. Well, to get six different ones. Uh, to get five different ones. Get, that's to get six different ones. Yeah. Um, yeah? So, so if I if I write this, everybody understands what I'm saying. Who's not sure? Okay. The the first one. So now it's it's blank, right? So we have nothing yet, and we're gonna draw draw them randomly. Um, uh, the first one is a tryptophan, and there's there's six options to put it. Right? We can put it here or there, or there's just just six options. So that's six, right? Uh, and let's say we put it here. The second one is a valine, and there's there's five options left to put it. So we can times five. Okay, so to to put these two there. There are six options for the tryptophan, five options for the valine, so in total there's 30, option, 30, 30 ways to do the valine and the, the tryptophan. It doesn't matter which one you put first, because whether it's 6 times 5 or 5 times 6, it's still 30. Um, and then, uh, what was the third one? The tyrosine. There's four options left. Yeah? And then, uh, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Isolucine uh, times three, and then uh, there's there's two options left for the serine, and the last one actually is only one option left. Uh, what? So that's six times five is thirty times four is one hundred and twenty times three is uh, uh, three hundred and sixty times two is seven hundred and twenty. 720 ways to get this, and this grows pretty, pretty rapidly where you have more sequences. Yeah, so for three sequences, it's only six. For six sequences, it's uh, 720. Yeah, yes. So because they're two series. Okay. That's that's correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, so
So now, this, uh, this, is, this is why uh, conservation is such a strong signal in, in, in biology, because if you see a, 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 a dominant, it doesn't have to be all tryptophans, it could be uh, uh, one other, small differences, right? But still, the, the number is going to be very small uh, compared to the other option. Okay, let's see where we're going. Ah, it's like a magic show. <laughs> okay, so now there's actually a way to measure this, and it's called information entropy. And uh, it, it, it was derived by, uh, by Shannon in the uh, early 1940s as a way to measure the information content of a message because he was interested in uh, radio broadcasting or sending radio messages, uh, in which in those days were just uh, spoken uh, messages. And he wanted to measure the amount of information lost after transmission. And so he was looking for a way to measure the amount of information before and after transmission. And if you subtract it, you get the amount of loss, the amount of information that was lost. And he, he, was, um, um, he was deriving it in this way, that he said, well, if you think about um, the information content in a message, you actually have, um, um, what's the word for it? It's, um, an occurrence, there's a different word for occurrence. So, event, yes, that's the word. So, each, each word in an English sentence is an event which, which has a certain probability. And so let's say there's, for the, for the first word in a the sentence, there's, there's three